Welcome to the third of the public lectures organized by the research project Peritia, Policy, Expertise and Trust in Action. I'm Maria Bagramian. I'm a professor of philosophy at University College Dublin, and I'm the coordinator of this project. The project is funded by the European Commission Horizon 2020 funding scheme and spreads across 11 institutions across 10 European countries. The lecture series on truth focus, focuses on the conditions of trust in our current age of disinformation. These lectures are hosted by UCD's Center for Ethics in Public Life and the American University of Armenia, both members of Peritia. Barvek Yegel Mer Asorva Peritia Dasa Hosuchan, Inspes Antial Ankamne, Menk Abahuhumeng, Hayereni Hamantas Tarkbanuchu. Եթե ուզում եք լսել հայերեն, դեր զումի պատուհանի ներքևի առաջ մասին ընդրեք Interpretation Armenian, այսինքը թարկմանություն հայերեն տարբերակը։ So that was a uh, welcoming note to our Armenian audiences. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Michael Lynch from University of Connecticut, whose work on truth and its role in various fields of discourse is of momentous significance to today's philosophy and also to the public domain. My colleague, Dr. Shane Bergen from UCD School of Education and a member of the Peritia Consortium will introduce uh, Professor Lynch and he will also conduct the Q&A session. We look forward to hearing from you with your questions at the end of the lecture by Professor Lynch. Um, thank you, Maria, and thank you, um, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you're all keeping well in whatever part of the world you're tuning in from. Uh, just looking at the participants there, it's great to see such, such diversity uh, of geographic diversity to begin with. You're very welcome to our third lecture in the lecture series. Um, our, our talk today is the democratic value of truth. What a time to be having it. And it, our, our speaker today is Professor uh, Michael Patrick Lynch and Michael Patrick Lynch is a Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut and he's the director there of the Humanities Institute and the director of the New England Humanities Consortium. His work, as I just said, concerns truth, democracy, public discourse and the ethics of technology. Um, Professor Lynch's newest book is uh, Know It All Society, Truth and Arrogance in Political Culture, one I'd highly recommend. Um, and his other books include The Internet of Us, Knowing More and Understanding Less in the Age of Big Data, um, In Praise of Reason, Why Rationality Matters for Democracy, and the New York Times uh, Sunday Book Reviews editors pick True to Life, uh, a wonderful collection of books from Professor Lynch. So in, in our talk today, uh, we, we'll hear a, a presentation uh, from Professor Lynch. And uh, during that, I'd encourage you to use the questions and answers button at the bottom of your screen uh, to, to, to pose your questions uh, to Professor Lynch. And at, at the end, we'll have lots of time to go through those um, and to, to kind of perhaps have a, a little bit of back and forth uh, with myself and Professor Lynch about, about those topics. I would ask that you keep your questions as as brief as possible so that um, I, can, I can read them and uh, turn them into, into a question that I can put to Professor Lynch. Um, if we don't get to your question, my, my apologies, we'll try our best to get to them or we tend to do is kind of group them by theme and ask one on behalf of many. So um, we will do our best to ask as many of your questions as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Lynch who's going to share his screen and remember, please use the questions and answers function at the bottom to put your questions in right through his talk as Professor, Professor Lynch is speaking. I'll talk to you soon. Professor Lynch, you're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And uh, I just wanna say thanks again for all the, to all the organizers for having me, uh, allowing me to participate in this incredibly important series of lectures on this very important topic. So 
what does truth really have to do with politics? If you've been following politics over the last, I don't know, few millennia, and certainly over the last five years, you might be inclined to say the answer is not much. As Hannah Arendt famously has noted, no one has ever really doubted that truth and politics are on rather bad terms with each other. Indeed, you might think that um, uh, over the last couple of years, if truth and uh, politics are at war with each other, that it's a war that truth is actually rather dramatically losing and perhaps most troubling, losing in democracies around the globe. And that seems to be bad news because we've always uh, perceived democracies as placing special value on truth. So today, in, within that context that I wanna ask two questions and explore them with you. The first question is, how is truth how, you know, how is truth a democratic value? What does that mean? And the second question I wanna ask is, what are the biggest threats to that value? Or at least what are some of those biggest threats? We'll explore three together today. So let's turn to the first question. What does it mean to say that uh, truth is a particularly democratic value? Well, let's start with some things it doesn't mean. When I'm talking about the democratic value of truth, I don't mean uh, by that uh, the value of the truth, whatever that might uh, mean itself. Uh, that is, I'm not talking about the value of some, of, of, of some one truth that's written down on a cave at the end of the universe. I'm obviously uh, not also not talking about the idea of getting everyone to believe the same thing, that is the, the same set of truths. Uh, that's not really possible with human beings, but even if it was possible, it would be particularly non-democratic to try to um, force everyone to believe the same thing. Democracies, after all, have traditionally str uh, um, strived to allow room for uh, different individuals to pursue different visions of the good life and therefore different views about uh, what, uh, what is true about the good life or human flourishing. So democracies aren't interested in trying to get everyone to believe the same thing about all topics. It's also, when talking about the democratic value of truth, we don't mean just the idea that knowledge is useful in democracies. Knowledge is useful in democracies, and in ways I'll just remark in a few minutes. But uh, you know, if, if that's all we have to say about the democratic value of truth, that's not particularly interesting. Because knowledge is useful and truth is useful to uh, all human beings, whether they're in democracies or otherwise. So that's not what I'm talking about either. I think that when we talk about the democratic value of truth, the most uh, uh, accurate thing that, and, and that we can say about that value is that it's a value that's inherent actually in the pursuit of truth. Democracies uh, have, as I'll put it, a special interest in institutions, methods, and sources that help us reliably pursue the truth. That is, help us reliably pursue true beliefs about the world. And why do they have that interest in methods and sources and institutions that help us reliably pursue what's true and avoid what's false? Well, first, uh, you know, in a pretty obvious way, democracies have an interest in having an informed populace because democracies want people to be able to make decisions at the voting booth. But prior to getting to that voting booth, it would be great if they knew something about the issues that they're asked, being asked to weigh in on. So democracies have an obvious interest in helping people pursue uh, or figure out what it is that they believe and do so in a reliable, reliable and informed way. They, democracies also have a special interest in effective deliberation. Um, prior to getting to the voting booth, uh, democracies hope to settle the questions and, res and help people figure out what's true by engaging in effective and meaningful deliberation with one another. That at least is the ideal. 
After all, democracies in, at, at the, in the ideal are meant to be spaces of reasons where disagreements are settled not by violence, not by manipulation, but by the free exchange of ideas and arguments. Democracies also have a special interest in, in, reliably, in institutions that reliably pursue the truth because of an interest in epistemic justice. We want democracies, in other words, want to not just encourage people and provide the means by which people can provide, uh, uh, pursue truth. They also want to uh, both protect those institutions and provide uh, equitable access to those institutions. To the extent to which some members of a populace can't are not able to employ the means that the other members of the populace can in pursuing the truth and knowledge and information, to that extent, those societies are acting in an undemocratic way. So again, democracies, to say that I think democracies place a special value on truth, what we mean, I think when the rubber hits the road, as we might say, what we mean is that democracies, or what we should mean, is that democracies have a special interest in promoting, protecting, and providing access to reliable ways, means, methods, sources, institutions of pursuing truth. But of course, this makes them, this interest, makes them vulnerable to certain what we might call epistemic threats. Threats to the value of truth as I've just articulated. And that's what I wanna talk about for the bulk of today. So let's talk, let's go right to now talking about threats to the value, democratic value of truth as we're seeing it around the globe today. The first threat I wanna talk about is what we might call the threat of epistemic disagreement. You know, in democracies um, right now around the globe, we're not just disagreeing over values, which is, you know, healthy in a democracy. That's democracies are me meant to help us resolve such differences in a peaceful way. But, and we're not just disagreeing over the facts, which is to be expected. We're actually now disagreeing also on whose sources for determining what the facts are, are the reliable ones. In other words, another way of putting this is, if the, one, uh, if the democratic value of truth consists in our interest in protecting and promoting, providing access to reliable means for, uh, for acquiring true beliefs, our first challenge is the fact that there's now considerable disagreement over which of those means, which of those standards, which of those sources are reliable. And that's a direct threat to the value as I've explained it. So epistemic disagreement is when we disagree over which methods and sources are reliable or the most reliable for pursuing truth. This is actually a very old problem. We, we, we recognize, uh, and many researchers have recognized, that this sort of issue as a political problem rot, tends to rise, it crops up whenever there's widespread, as we might call it, epistemic unsettledness. That is, whenever there is uh, there is a general lack of agreement on over whether certain standards, perhaps certain new sources of information are reliable. And so it's not, uh, it's not uncommon to see widespread epistemic disagreement when, for example, new kinds of technology, particularly technology relating to information acquisition, arrive on the scene. For example, the printing press or the internet. So this is, an old, this is an old problem. Today, we see it manifested in debates over uh, the reliability of science to help us answer certain questions like uh, having to do with climate change or the pandemic or vaccines. But we also see it in straight out political disagreements about whether, for example, in my country, Fox News is to be trusted as a reliable source of information, or the New York Times is to be trusted more as a reliable source of information. But if we think about this philosophically, it really, this issue really starts to become very, very difficult um, 
philosophically, when we think about it as being rooted in an even older set of issues that were highlighted by the ancient Greek skeptics and the ancient skeptics in general. One ancient skeptic, Sextus Empiricus, is pictured here. What Sextus pointed out is that if you challenge my sources of information, you say, well, you know, uh, why should I trust your sources of information? I'm gonna be faced with a couple different choices. One, I can try to defend my source as being reliable. But if I do that, I'm presumably gonna to have to rely on some other source of information to defend the, re the reliability of the first sources, uh, the reliability of the first source. But then again, you can rinse and repeat. You can ask me the same question. Well, why should I trust that source? Pretty soon, because I'm human, I'm gonna run out of sources. So at some point, I'm either gonna to have to, if I haven't convinced you, I'm either gonna to have to uh, dig in and just dogmatically claim that my sources are reliable, or perhaps I might end up looping around in a circle and trying to defend my sources, my methods for figuring out beliefs uh, by way of appealing to those sources and methods. Or I can just give up and decide that I don't really trust my sources myself. I can become skeptical. Those are uncomfortable choices. And in some way, you might think that the, the problems of epistemic disagreement sometimes seem to present us with a similar problem. Because when people on other, either side of a political debate or debate over, let's say, the reliability of a certain sort of uh, scientific procedure or the appropriateness of using science to resolve this issue, often will uh, argue with each other in a way that in, in, bears some resemblance to the, the manner that Sextus predicted we would argue about these things uh, all those years ago. Now, the interesting thing about this problem of disagreeing over which sources are reliable is that from a political standpoint, it may not matter whether there's actually that much what we might call real epistemic disagreement. I mean, after all, you might say, well, if we just scratch the, you know, on the surface, it may look like people are using different methods for figuring out what's true or false. But you might think that deep down, you know, a little bit, you dig a little deeper and still, because we're human beings, we're still using a lot of the same methods. We might be disagreeing over certain applications of the methods, but perhaps the methods and sources that we're using are actually all not that different. Maybe that's true. I won't get into that right now because the political point I think that that matters for this discussion is that even if there's a perception of this kind of disagreement, that itself is a political problem. The perception of epistemic disagreement is a political problem as much as real epistemic disagreement itself. And the reason for that is pretty obvious to see because in politics perception matters. And it's also uh, particularly easy to see because uh, if I just perceive you as using unreliable means for pursuing the truth, if I perceive your, your sources as being untrustworthy and you perceive my sources as being untrustworthy, then even if we're wrong, even if actually both of us deep down are using the same sources and we just don't know it, we're still in a political problem. We're still not gonna trust one another. And the reason that that's a problem is because, of course, that situation I just described is going to lead, uh, strengthen what the psychologists call effective polarization. We'll start to, even if we're just perceiving accurately or inaccurately, uh, each other to be in an epistemic disagreement with each other, we're going to start to see the other side as uninformed, as untrustworthy, and perhaps all sorts of other nasty things. Also, uh, it, it's possible that, uh, that this is perhaps an empirical question, but it's, it's possible that this type of perception of epistemic disagreement can, can deepen distrust uh, in experts, that is undermine trust in experts in general. Obviously, if I, if I perceive your, your methods and sources to be unreliable, I'm gonna also perceive the experts on your side who use those methods and sources as being unreliable. But I might, of course, begin to start just mistrusting expertise 
all across the board. And that uh, itself is a political problem for reasons that I think all of us here are well aware. But the most bizarre after effect of epistemic disagreement is sort of the opposite of what the ancient skeptics thought that it might be. The ancient skeptics thought that if we reflected on the fact that we can't really seem to defend, according to them anyway, the reliability of anybody's sources for pursuing the truth, then that should encourage us to sort of, you know, become less dogmatic. But in fact, it looks like the history of the human condition since then has shown the opposite to be the case. Bizarrely, it often seems that when people are placed in a position where they can't seem uh, to, where they distrust other people's sources and maybe even realize that they have a hard time defending the reliability of their own, they actually start to not become less dogmatic, but often they dig in. And that brings us to our next, uh, next problem. And that's the problem I call the problem of arrogance. What we might call epistemic or intellectual arrogance is the idea, the attitude that somebody has when they think they have nothing to learn about a subject from somebody else. When nothing that anybody else can teach them will improve their, uh, their worldview. This is the attitude of, as it were, the classic know-it-all. Well, the funny thing is, is that know-it-alls may actually know a lot. Um, they actually might be real experts. As we know, experts can be arrogant. But uh, arrogance is distinct from just knowing a lot, obviously. How is it distinct? Well, as the, the philosopher Alessandro Tanazzini has made clear in a number of recent publications, including in, in a forthcoming book, The Mismeasure of the Self, what she's noted is this is an attitude that has a, a basis in, in two other features of our psychology. The epistemically arrogant person obviously feels the sense of superiority, but that superiority is not based on their actual knowledge, even if they have a lot of it. Insofar as you're arrogant, you're, you're, that attitude is the result of both the combination of superiority and insecurity, insecurity. The arrogant person is at root, root insecure. They perceive themselves as under threat from somebody else and their ego as being under threat. And so they react with arrogance. Is that rational? No, but whoever said humans were very rational. At its limit, epistemic arrogance, this type of arrogance really ends up equating ego and truth. It becomes this sort of attitude that feeds into the incoherent thought, that incoherent both I think psychologically and from the standpoint of, of the nature of truth, incoherent that the incoherent idea that what is what I say is true just because I say it. That's the sort of apex of epistemic arrogance. And it's a damaging attitude. That it's a damaging attitude is also not a new, uh, a, new, uh, a new issue, a new observation. And the problem of epistemic arrogance isn't a new problem. Michel Montaigne, the great French essayist and philosopher of the 16th century, thought that indeed the problem of dogmatic arrogance was, uh, as he said it, as he said, a scourge upon mankind. And he felt that it was very much the root problem behind a lot of the dogmatic strife of his day. And he knew very much what he was talking about because he lived through a series of civil wars in France that left uh, that country uh, littered from end to end with corpses. And he became so revolted by uh, this, this dogmatic arrogance that he declared that, look, dogmatism, dogmatic hatred, as he put it, is, uh, has never brought anyone uh, closer to goodness, but it has done wonders for the wars and hatreds in the world. So in recoiling from this, he literally built himself an ivory tower and surround, 
filled it with books and fell, as he said, into the arms of the learned virgins. He tried, in other words, to push the world away, to retreat, perhaps in the, in the very manner that the ancient skeptics had suggested. Just give up uh, on, on beliefs and, and commitments in general, he thought. I don't recommend this strategy. It, first of all, it didn't work out for Montaigne. He ended up getting dragged back into politics. And secondly, it's not very good from the standpoint of a democracy, because in democracy, we need our citizens to be uh, committed, to be involved, to be engaged. But nonetheless, the warning that um, Montaigne gave us about arrogance is really worth heeding. Because what Montaigne knew is that dogmatic epistemic arrogance becomes a real problem politically when it becomes partisan, when it becomes tribal. That's when arrogance becomes baked into a worldview, into an ideology. It becomes the attitude that we have nothing to learn from them. Not just that I don't have anything to learn, it's that we don't have anything to learn from those people. And it encourages turning away from the evidence and experience of others, of other groups that you, that the person who is being arrogant sees themselves as epistemically superior to. It increases a sense of entitlement. I, our group is the group that knows everything, so we should get special treatment. And it ultimately, of course, can lead to, uh, to furthering, deepening the first problem that we talked about a moment ago, epistemic disagreement. And it provides a real challenge to the democratic value of truth. Remember I said the democratic value of truth consists in dem democracies having a special interest in the, those institutions and methods and sources that help us reliably pursue the truth. The first challenge was, well, what if we disagree about which sources those are? The second challenge is, what if it turns out that some people think they already know what the truth is, so they don't have to worry about protecting these so-called reliable sources of information? Why bother to pursue the truth if you already know what it is? So a second challenge and a profound one to um, the democratic value of truth. Okay, and now I wanna turn to uh, the the third and final challenge that I'll talk about today. And that's a problem of information pollution. This is the most obvious challenge to the democratic value of truth, as I've said it, because it involves the dumping of what I'll call toxic information into the media environment. Information can be toxic in a variety of ways. For here, for now, we can just think of toxic information as being either false information or information that's not based on any evidence or information that might be true in some respects, but misleading in others. To follow the metaphor, this dumping of information corrupts the epistemic water supply, the conditions, as John Dewey called it, the philosopher John Dewey, of democratic discourse. If it corrupts that water supply, the conditions of democratic discourse, you've got to challenge to the democratic value of truth as I've articulated it. And obviously to deal with this threat, we need to understand all sorts of things. We need to understand uh, more about the information polluters. Who are the people who are contributing to this? Whether they be troll farms or state actors or politicians or what have you and their Twitter accounts. Um, we also have to understand the role that social media platforms, the enablers of this pollution are playing. We need to understand more about the social uh, information economy. But we also have to focus a little bit on us. That is the function of various kinds of online political communication that many of us engage in. And that's what I wanna to end today with, getting us to reflect on the function of various kinds of online political communication. That sounds, you might sound, well, why do we wanna focus on that? Well, the reason is because if we misunderstand that function, the function, what's really going on when we're communicating online, that can make us vulnerable to information pollution. So I'm gonna give you two examples, two quick examples. First example is, is, involves asking yourself this question. 
What are we doing when we share news stories online? By a news story, I mean, for present purposes, just a story that uh, at least purports to be from a reliable source of information that is a journalistic source. This could be something that is a real news story that is, is from such a source, or it could be a fake news story. For present purposes, I'll call them both news stories. So what are we doing when we, when we share these things online? We share a lot of things online, pictures of our kids, cats, uh, pictures of ourselves a lot. Um, but we also, uh, human beings, a lot of platforms around the world share what I'm calling news stories. What are we doing? Well, if, if you ask us, what we'll generally say is that, well, we're, we're conveying information. We're, we're telling people important information that we've encountered and we're, as it were, giving them access to that information. That's what we say, and there's research to show this, that you know, this is what we'll tell each other that we're doing. But is that what we're really doing? Is that the nature of the act that we're engaging in? To, to, uh, to see whether that's true, let's very quickly just focus on some of the things we do do and some of the things we don't do when we're sharing news stories online. Well, here's what we don't do. What we don't do is we don't tend to read what we're sharing. A number of studies, including some that are just coming out, uh, but for example, one from Columbia University in 2016, indicate that uh, the majority of us, indeed a striking majority of people who share news stories online, do not read what they're sharing. As little as four in 10 people actually have read what they share uh, on the platforms. Now, <clears throat> uh, anecdotal reports from researchers at the platforms themselves have told me that, uh, basically off the record, that it could go as high as 90% of the people don't read what they're sharing online when they're sharing news stories. By reading here, they mean actually something that a lot of us uh, might not consider actual reading. They mean clicking through to the story. So a lot of people don't even click through to the things that they're sharing. And that's very interesting. Because if you are thinking of yourself as sharing information, if you're conveying information, and you're saying this is important information, doesn't seem like that's, you know, if you haven't read the information you're conveying, it's not really clear you're conveying it. You're not really doing what you think you're doing if you haven't read it. Well, what do we do? Well, again, a whole suite of research coming out in uh, political psychology and cognitive neuroscience has been su suggesting that what we do share online is we share content that expresses strong emotions. Obviously we do that when we, when we share pictures of our kids or our cats or, or what have you, um, because those can elicit strong emotions. Uh, but political news stories can also elicit strong emotions too. Emotions, for example, like outrage and other values that are connected. Some recent research seems to suggest that shares and tweets that contain, for example, strong moral language, words like murder, for example, are more likely to be shared. And that's not surprising, given what we know about the social media economy. That economy rewards emotional, um, emotional uh, uh, provoking uh, tweets and, and posts, because that's what keeps eyeballs on posts. The algorithms will push posts that will cause us to keep our attention on the platform. And one thing we know about human beings is things that provoke strong emotions get our attention. So that suggests that, okay, we don't read what we're sharing, but what we do share are things that seem connected to strong emotions that often reflect concerns having to do with our identity, our political convictions. So a hypothesis is that the primary function of sharing these stories isn't really conveying information, it's some sort of identity expression. By a primary, the primary function here, what I mean is that which explains that uh, why we continue to engage in the communicative act. So if you look at a communicative act, type of act in language, you can ask, well, why does that type of act continue to be produced? Why does it be, continue to be consumed in the cognitive economy? My suggestion is that contrary to what we might tell ourselves, the reason we continue to do this thing is not to convey information. It's not that we think it's a great way of getting information across to our peers, uh, although we may think that. 
But that's not why it is that we're, we're, that act continues to persist on social media. It continues to persist because it allows us to express our identity reflected, connected emotions. I wanna end with uh, another example, uh, and that is the example of bald-faced political lies. Now, hopefully these are not the sorts of communicative acts telling a bald-faced political lie that any of you here would ever engage in. Uh, but it is an act that is engaged in by certain politicians, and one might think, in fact, increasingly engaged in, and rather alarmingly, in certain democracies, including my own, uh, over the last number of years. And it's interesting to think about the function of these, this type of community act as well, because the one of the things about social media is that it allows us to share what, of course, politicians themselves say, perhaps on that very platform, on Twitter, for example. So we need to think about both the function of the assertion of these lies, and I'll give an example and tell you what I mean in a second, and also the function that we, the function of our repeating them, if we do repeat them, or the people who do repeat them, why they repeat them. What do I mean by a political bald-faced lie? Well, what I mean is a lie that's, uh, that consists in the assertion of obvious falsehoods by a politician or the representatives. That is something that's told to the uh, to a in, a in a public setting by a politician or the representative that is, and this is the key, obviously false. By obviously false, I mean false in the sense in which it is almost it's it, it requires really no effort to see that it's false. Now, bald face lies are the sorts of things that we do know from other parts of our life, right? Uh, the little kid who has chocolate cake all over his face and says to his mother, I didn't eat the cake, right? He's telling a bald face lie, obviously. Now, um, uh, no big deal in that case, sort of cute. Uh, we can also imagine cases, for example, where you might be at a bus stop and you are standing in the rain, it's pouring, and the person next to you says, you know, it's not raining. And even if it was raining, I, I wouldn't be getting wet. Now, if that person said something like that to you in a real situation, you might think at first they're laughing, they're joking rather, right? You might sort of think they were joking, but if it became clear that they really didn't think it was raining and they were asserting that they were, weren't getting wet when obviously they are, then you might start to you know, really look forward to that bus coming faster. <laughs> uh, and you, know, you really wanna get away from this person. Because that's a, in our ordinary life, these things are bizarre. I mean, you know, when somebody says something that's obviously false, and I don't mean just false in the sense it's controversial, or even that it requires research. I mean something that's clearly demonstrably false. Those things are actually relative, used to be, and perhaps still are, relatively rare in politics. But we have, I think, seen uh, an uptick of it, certainly in my own country uh, during the Trump administration. Here's an example of something that one might think of as a bald-faced lie. Here's a weather map of a hurricane tracker that the president presented uh, in a press conference. And uh, clearly the map had been modified uh, rather crudely to indicate that the track of the hurricane was different from what actually the scientists had said that it was. And um, then you know it was asserted immediately afterwards that the map had not been modified, even though that was clearly false because we were looking at the map when that was being uttered. There are many other examples. You can pick your own favorite examples, perhaps, from your own political context. The question I want to ask is, what function do bald-faced lies serve? What are they doing? Well, one thing they're not generally seen to be doing, or at least not doing very well, is deceiving anyone. Um, I mean, they will deceive some people, because some people will believe anything. But if you want to, you know, if you're a politician and you really want to deceive the public, there's lots of time-honored ways of doing that via propaganda, altering news sources, planting false stories. There's a lot of ways to deceive people that are, you know, that are well known. Saying something obviously false, like it's not raining when it is raining, isn't really a great way to change people's minds. So what are they doing? Well, you know, I might also well add, you know, despite what's often said, they're not really sarcasm or jokes either. Anything that has to be later explained away as a joke 
generally wasn't intended as a joke. So in order to see what the what what the uh, what is going on here, I'm going to give an analogy. Now, I, I it's an analogy that involves a football game, and I'm going to. I was thinking initially when I wrote this, being an American of American football game, but the word the, the, the example works uh, whether or not you're talking about that strange sport of American football, or you're talking about what Americans call soccer. That is what the the rest of the world calls football. Doesn't matter. Take your favorite sport. Imagine that a player on, in this game runs out of bounds off the field, and in my example, runs down the field and declares himself as having scored a touchdown. Now, he's clearly out of bounds. He's broken the rules. It's been caught on the camera. It can be seen on slow motion on the jumbotron above. He clearly stepped out of bounds, but he asserts that he didn't step out of bounds and that he in fact scored a, a goal uh, of some sort. What would be going on? Well, in a normal case, that person would be con considered uh, well to have some issues. And if they didn't relent, they'd probably be, they would be penalized or pulled out of the game, all sorts of things. But now imagine that in this game, imagine that this player has some power. Imagine that this player owns the field. Now, when they assert that they didn't break the rules, that they actually scored a goal, and they clearly didn't, now we're in problems. Because now imagine that the, the, the person saying this, the player, also has supporters in the fans, in, in, the, in, the, in the stands. And those supporters are going, yelling, not out of bounds, scored a goal. They're insisting that what their favorite is saying is true. So he keeps repeating this obvious falsehood, despite the fact that we can all see on the camera, on the, on the television, that in fact, he's wrong. Why would he, what, what's the purpose? What purpose is being uh, accomplished here? Not really deception, I think. More likely, what is happening is an assertion of power. The politician is making an assertion and saying, look, I'm going to force you because I have the power to do it, to treat this as if it's true. Because after all, the other team now has a choice. He has power. So they either have to go along with what he said, or they have to, they have to perhaps get in a fight, or they'd storm off the field and, 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 and just give up the game. Not good choices. So I think bald-faced political lies are assertions of power. They're assertions of power meant to get us to treat certain propositions as if they were true. And getting people to treat the proposition as if it's true, even if they don't believe it's really true, is for political purposes just almost as good. Now, what, are, what happens? Why do people who are not in power repeat these things? Well, that's a hard question, but a clue might be uh, given, for example, by this, this now uh, well-discussed study from 2018 from uh, two political scientists um, who uh, presented um, groups of American voters with these two pictures, uh, among many others. One picture is a picture from the, one of the Obama uh, inaugurations as a president, and the other picture is a picture, the one with less people, from the Trump inauguration. What they asked the, the Ameri these Americans is they asked in the study people to say, which of these pictures uh, has more people in it? Now, they didn't ask which, which inauguration more people attended. That's a different question. Just which of these pictures has more people in it? Now, interestingly, it turned out that significant, statistically significant uh, uh, amount of Trump supporters tended to say that the, not all of them, but a statistically significant amount, that is more Trump supporters than people who had voted for other candidates or didn't vote at all, tended to say that the one which has obviously less picture of people in it had more people in it. Now, why would you do that? Why would you say that? Well, it might be that you're so deluded that you actually believe that, you know, math works in a different way or that people look different than, than than, or there's invisible people or something. 
but that doesn't seem very likely. What the 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 what the uh, the people who the, the what the uh, the the researchers suggested, and what I'm going to suggest here is that the folks were responding because they were expressing an identity. They were expressing their identity. They were saying, they were saying, I'm with this guy. I know what you're trying to get at. And I think I want to treat this proposition as true, whether or not they believed it. From a political standpoint, maybe it doesn't matter whether they believe it. What matters is how they act. All right, so, and that reminds us, bringing it around to Hannah Arendt again. As she, as she writes, darkly said, before mass leaders seize the power to fit reality to their lives, their propaganda is marked by its extreme contempt for facts as such. For in their opinion, fact depends entirely on the power of the man who can fabricate it. And that nicely sums up the problems that bald face laws and information pollution in general uh, pose to the democratic value of truth. So just very, you know, very quickly, this, this suggests both of these examples that our lack of awareness about the function of our communication can make us vulnerable to information pollution that feeds our identity and our arrogant sense that we are right and that they, whoever they is, know nothing. And that in turn feeds our sense of mistrust and disagreement. So to recap, democracies are committed to valuing the, and pr the pursuit of truth and they face certain epistemic threats, epistemic disagreement or the perception thereof, arrogance, and information pollution. Some of the lessons that I, I'd like to draw from this, or I'd like you to think about, uh, are that I think, first of all, these reflections suggest that these problems are interlocking and amplifying each other in ways that make, it, that make people forget that they live in a common reality and are encouraging what some people call a post-truth culture. I mean, literally, of course, there's no such thing as post-truth. Truth is truth, and it's not going away whether we like it or not. But post-truth culture, generally, if, it's, if it means anything, means cultures that are placing less value on truth in just the ways that I was articulating. And to combat these problems, I think we're going to have to understand that while we humans may be frail and uncertain pursuers of truth as individuals, we can compensate for that frailty by trying to bolster and protect various social epistemic institutions and methods. We need to protect those institutions, institutions that are under threat worldwide. We need to call out information polluters, polluters and toxic lives and democracies. Democracies, while you're still living in a democracy, it's important to utilize those means to speak up and call out those who are engaging in pollution and toxic lives. We also have to be, of course, more responsible if we can as individuals. We need to be more self-aware consumers and producers of information. Only by both combining this, these institutional responses and more personal efforts can we hope, I think, to recapture that sense of common reality that is so crucial to the health of democracy. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Lynch. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful talk. Um, it was so, so engaging and so terrifying, but yes, uh, so assuring as I think there are, there are signs in there for things that we can, we can all do, um, ways we can think. Um, and, and there's, I, I, I certainly come away from your talk today and from reading your book with a sense of hope, um, which I, I hope many of the, the other people today have. So we, we have a, a range of questions for you, Michael, that um, um, I hope to put to you uh, on behalf of the, the many attendees from, from our YouTube channel and from um, our, our Zoom link. And the, uh, the first one, which uh, <laughs> I guarantee you is true, is from Angela Long. And, and Angela says, the only, thing, the only question I have is when can we hear more, Professor Lynch? And could it be that his next talk is twice as long? So uh, a vote of confidence <laughs> there for you. Um, but uh, perhaps I'll, I'll move to a, a more serious question. And, and this one is uh, from somebody on YouTube by, by Lilith uh, Bekairian. 
And um, Lillette is asking, uh, it's, a, it's a fundamental uh, philosophical or conceptual uh, question. Um, it's asking, how is untruth defined and how is it different from disinformation or lie? So um, I think, you know, that uh, this might be a best pose to, uh, uh, to the organizers, but I think it, when I think about, when we think about untruth, we're, I think that as I understand it, this is being used in the present context of these lectures as uh, a, an umbrella term that is covering a range of phenomena that we might call involve uh, using another umbrella term, inauthentic behavior. So that might be lies, that might be uh, bald faced lies, very different sort of thing, the thing I just talked about, uh, might involve information pollution of all the various forms that I alluded to, uh, and it could involve propaganda and, and those, those sorts of things. So I think you know one, one of the things that we're finding in research uh, projects like this one around uh, uh, Around the world is that we're looking, we're finding that we need certain umbrella terms that help us capture these range of phenomena because sometimes, obviously, they all have distinctions between them, but they also are going to have certain commonalities. So uh, that's, I think, uh, as I understand it, um, the the thrust of that term. I Thank you. Um, I, I have another question here, a follow-up from, from Joseph Lacey, who says, in modern times, elections are quintessentially uh, are the quintessential democratic moment, yet from the perspective of the actors involved, the goal is not truth, but to win power. And in this sense, are modern democratic elections and the pursuit of truth irreconcilable? Yes, yeah, so that happens to be the puzzle that I'm working on right now. It's, that's a tremendous observation. And uh, the new book that I'm working on right now is about that issue. Mm. How is it that we can make sense of the, the democratic value of truth, given that it seems mysterious whether even political judgments can even be true or false? Because after all, you might think political judgments are, as the as, as was just re remarked, um, really in the game of power. That's why we make those judgments. That's why we engage in politics according to one vision. But I think actually, uh, while that, uh, we can all feel the pull of that, right? Uh, that sort of cynical and per but perhaps accurate thought. I think we need to remind ourselves that through, since Plato and no doubt well before him, there's always been two sort of visions of, well, there's more than two, but two particularly salient visions for this conversation of politics. On one version, politics is really war by other means to invert a famous aphorism. It is, yeah, it is the, right, exactly. It's the attempt to try to uh, just get your side's way. That's what politics is about. Uh, and full stop. The other vision, is that politics is actually an attempt to work together collectively to solve problems of conflict and coordination. It's a, it's a vision that sees prog progress as possible towards something better, that politics is meant to be getting us to a, to a better place, a more just, to, to justice. On the first vision, Progress is irrelevant. Progress, the only sense in which there's progress is whether you're in power. If you're in power, then progress. <laughs> if you're not in power, lack of progress. But that's not really progress in any objective sense. That's just change, regime change. The other account, the other vision, and the one that I think I'm committed to is that progress is possible. And if there's progress though, if there is such a thing as real political progress, that presupposes the idea that there's some standard by which we can judge that progress. And, what's, and that's just another way of talking about the possibility that some of our judgments about what's just or not, what's right or not, what's equitable or not, can be true and others, sadly, are to be ruled out. That is, in some cases, not so sadly, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, what I, what I wanna say is, uh, if you believe in the possibility of political progress, then you're already committed 
to unpacking that puzzle of how we can pursue truth of politics. And what and we really need to do is get down to the hard work of unpacking it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I guess a follow up might be, do, do you see when, you know, you think we think of democracy and we think of the, the spectrum of democracy in, in across the world, are there uh, aspects of certain democracies that you look upon and say, you know, that leads to that more deliberative progress orientated um, form versus the more maybe tribal or uh, polarized view of, of politics that you also presented? Well, I think democracies that, uh, I mean, I think one, one it's, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. What are the signs that a democracy is moving in a more, let's say, more just and dec- democratic, equitable direction as opposed to going the other way? Mm-hmm. I, th- I think um, based, and, and there's, that's a complicated question, but let me answer it by alluding to, because of, in the context of this talk, how that's re- re- relevant to some of the suggestions I made. I think that uh, democracies are always uh, generally going to be more democratic to the extent to which they uh, are protecting and promoting and providing access to education to all their citizens. I think it's, it's, and by that, I mean, not just to formal education, but to education and media sources that have reliable uh, bits of information. I think societies that have uh, a grip on uh, the, the, the more of a grip that we have on how to m- make our internet and digital platforms uh, both accessible but also equitable and um, reliable platforms for in the, the distribution of information. I think societies that are doing better on that score and that, that's complicated to figure that out and we're going to disagree on some of the, me- the mm-hmm. metrics of course. Um, maybe not you and I, but the people in general will disagree. Sure. So I think I think I think you know clearly it's the signs of progress are going to be partly related to the types of what I call reliable uh, uh, means for um, pursuing the truth to the extent that those are are promoted and protected. So I think societies that are paying attention to experts, for example, that are paying attention to scientific uh, investigation, while at the same time making sure that they place those experts in in a healthy public discourse where you know their their results can be legitimately scrutinized by other experts and by uh, to the extent that it's possible by the public at large. To to that extent, I think you know again you're you're and by all these scores, by the way, there are. You know, and of course, freedom of expression is extremely important. Societies that are not allowing people to engage in public discourse in a meaningful way with each other are not being de- democratic. And right now, just to finish on this note, I think there are a score of democracies around the world, uh, including my own, that are performing very poorly on these these um, these particular by these particular standards. Uh, some are performing more poorly than others. Um, and of course, no one ever is do very good at these things. I mean, you know, I think when you when we talk about political progress and its possibility, we're generally always talking about a slowly bending the arc of history towards justice. It's a slow process, not something that happens overnight. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, you nicely um, bring us to a, another question, uh, a summarized version from, from Aaron uh, Thierry, who says, how can a politician, I suppose an actor in that system, try to build bridges to restore um, a shared epistemic environment with their opponents without being seen as to kind of sell out to their political base? Yeah. So um, uh, I think that um, for politicians, the problem of epistemic disagreement as we're seeing around, especially in my country right now, is acute. Because if it's just, even if the politician themselves, right, they, they have maybe, maybe they're not that particular person, isn't quite sure whether the other side's methods are reliable or not. The fact that their base, for example, might perceive the other side's sources are completely unreliable, puts that politician in, a, in, a, in a democracy, if they're representing that base, in the position of, of either having to go against the base and therefore no longer being elected or um, correcting their perceptions of what's true. I think the right thing to do here is in, when placed in that situation is to do what some politicians actually 
occasionally, very occasionally do do, which is to, to actually dig in and uh, not to their bases views, but into themselves for some courage and say, look, I think we need to at least start listening to what these, these people are trying to say. And they, what they need to do is find, and I think this is in general, there's a lot, you know, a lot of research that a project that I was involved in that Connecticut had been doing about how to get politicians to find the language to do this. One of the things that's very important is that when, for example, you're, let's say a politician who's trying to convince people in your base to get to trust the vaccines, hmm. right? or to believe that COVID is actually real. How do you do that? Well, one thing you do is you start small. You probably don't give a big speech. You go around in your community and you start to stop in on people. And you first talk about things that don't have to do with COVID or the vaccines. Um, as they used to say in the American South, the politician who begins with, how's your mama in them? Meaning, you know, asking about the person's family. This is the sort of thing that good politicians know how to scale up. That is to actually begin conversations, to, to begin a center and a platform of trust. And then from that platform of trust, you begin to start asking people, well, what are your, why are you, why are you afraid of, of vaccines? Or why do you think that COVID might not be real? And to listen to what they have to say, but then to give them some, some facts. I think that's, you know, giving the facts unadulterated without that sort of effort in the first place generally is often very not, not very helpful. So I think that we are, is it possible for politicians to do that? Yeah, well, we're seeing some of it in, in, in our country with regard to the examples that I'm giving, but we're also seeing a lot of cowardice as well, a, a ton of cowardice. Um, it's very often, it's, it's unfortunately very rare that you have somebody like former uh, Senator John Mc. McCain in my country, who politician whose political views I disagree with very much, uh, but who during when he was running for president, when a famously when uh, a member of his, an audience in a press conference uh, got up and started talking about Barack Obama being uh, a Muslim, he was running against Obama. McCain stopped the news conference and said, that's just not true. He's not a Muslim. He was born in the country and I respect the man. And I'm not going to be tolerate people saying things that are false about my opponent. That earned him some real, I think, courage points. To the extent that we can find our inner John McCain in a certain sense, that's when politicians, I think, are doing the democratic thing. I hope that was helpful. I wish I could give you a more syst uh, systemic answer. And I'm sorry for using American politics as my guide here, but uh, speaking as American, that's what I know best. I think most most uh, people watching today will be familiar with Senator McCain and uh, his like you know his and his journey then beyond that when when President Trump was in power and the things he said and did. I, I would, yeah, I would agree with your your sentiments there, and perhaps Mitt Romney uh, subsequently in speaking out in certain ways. Um, I, I've a, a question here from Heather Douglas, who's actually our next speaker um, at oh, the next yes. seminar. <laughs> and uh -oh. uh, Professor Douglas uh, asks, would it help to ground trust in practice through the principle of fallibilism? Um, that is, trust sources that offer corrections to their work and don't just, uh, and, and that you shouldn't in turn trust sources that do not. Um, would that help support the institutions that pursue the truth? I, I tend to think yes. I think there's, uh, as Professor Douglas knows much more than I, I think that there's interesting sets of research going on about this right now. And uh, I tend to think that myself, that, uh, and this is based partly on some work that we did here in Connecticut, that uh, um, while it's the case that you can get, a, you can get a, an initial wave of trust from people if you sort of dogmatically assert things, right, in a certain confident way, uh, you will carry some people along with you, right? So for example, Donald Trump, for example, has never said any, anything, he's famous for never ever apologizing or ever said that he said anything wrong, right? He was, he was like incredibly consistent in that one regard, right? Um, and obviously he has a lot of followers. The question is whether, as I was getting at before, are those followers actually believing what he said? I think that's actually somewhat irrelevant politically. 
They're acting as if what he says is true, and that's what matters. Uh, from politically, I mean, of course, beliefs matter. It's just that politically speaking, it's actions that matter more. Now, with regard to fallibilism, I think that yes, uh, it, you know, often we do have this worry. There's an ongoing debate to the extent to which, you know, for example, on COVID vaccines, should we, should scientists, for example, should they, um, uh, when they find out that there are some problems with the vaccine, should that be broadcast? Does it undermine trust? Ongoing question. In this is like an experiment in real time to find mm -hmm. out to the extent to which we admit fallibilism helps or hurts. The real answer, of course, is it's complicated because sources that admit their fallibilism is a different question than just admitting a mistake with regard to one single thing. But nonetheless, I think that in the long term, despite my alluding to that problem uh, with fallibilism, uh, it seems to me that in the long term, you tend to, you know, let me put it this way. If your plumber, right, comes over and says, here, I fixed this problem and you pay the plumber. And then the problem isn't solved. The plumber comes back and says, well, no, the water's all over the place. And, you, and the plumber says, oh, no problem. I didn't do anything wrong. You're not gonna really probably be as trustworthy. Maybe they're right, right? But you'll be more inclined, I think, if the plumber says, oh, I'm so sorry. This, I did, I thought I saw the problem. Obviously the problem was different. So I'm gonna work on that now. That's a, at least at that point, you, you might still hire another plumber. <laughs> but at least you're not going to think that person was crazy or trying to rip you off, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so to the extent to which I think, you know, people admit, you know, your mechanic, your plumber, uh, your accountant, it recognizes that they're not gods, they're mm -hmm. human beings. To that extent, we can hopefully see a little humanity in them and pull out a little, little humanity of each other. And why, why we seem to work that way with mechanics, plumbers, you know, it's not like people are running around going, I don't trust plumbers. I know more than any plumber, right? That's bizarre. But people are doing that with doctors, healthcare professionals, somehow people who, who plumbers who think that, you know, would certainly look askance at anybody not trusting their advice, that people are somehow, you know, people, we tend to think that we know better than certain scientists who spent their whole life working on an issue like climate change. And, got a little off topic there, Heather, but I hope that feeds, <laughs> you know connects to what you were concerned with. Well, we'll hear more from Heather in two weeks' time, but I, I can interject and say, you know, I completely agree with you that I, I should trust plumbers more um, as somebody who tried and failed to fix <laughs> yeah. a blockage in our, our bathroom sink and was told, would you not just get somebody who knows what they're doing to have a look at that um, <laughs> after I, I proceeded to make things worse? <laughs> <laughs> but let, let me let me move on before I disgrace myself any further from a question from my wonderful colleague, Claudia Frahiola. And Claudia asks about what we can do. She says, what would uh, a responsible way, um, how could we act responsibly uh, such uh, that we respond to this epistemic threat on social media platforms? Can we stop the spread of those lies and actually change people's attitudes on those platforms? Should we engage, I suppose? Yes, uh, I think, that, well, there's the question about, it's a couple different questions. One the overarching question, as I understand it, is that to what extent is it possible for us, for, for individuals like ourselves to actually make a difference on these issues? There, it is possible to make a difference. Look, no social change, no progress that we have ever made as human beings, only involves changes in institutions. It also involves changes in attitudes. Mm -hmm. You think about civil rights, you think about gay rights, you think about transgender rights, you think about, about uh, the overcoming of slavery as a, as a norm across the world. Not that we overcome racism, but if you think about those fights, you realize that there have been, those all have involved changes at the political and institutional and often corporate level, but also changes in attitudes. People like to debate about which comes first. I don't. I think they both need to happen at the same time. And they just, and that's, that's unfortunate. It would be easier if we could just say, well, do one or the other. You have to do both. So we do have to take some responsibility. One of the things we have to do as individuals, for example, is to stop sharing things that we don't read. 
Mm. Be aware of what you're engaged in doing, right? Not that any of you here, I, I can't see all your faces, but I know that just by dint of, uh, of listening to this talk, you're all very serious people who would never ever None of us here would have ever shared anything on any social media platform that we didn't read carefully. In fact, I'm sure all of you read all the footnotes in everything that you share and the footnotes of the footnotes. Uh, but, you know, other people you've heard do, and those people need to start reading what they're sharing. So that would help all by itself, because among other things, it would slow down the transfer of information, which right now I don't think any of us really thinks needs to be sped up any further. Um, so I think that's one thing. The other thing, as far as engaging with people on the other side on social media, I think that can sometimes be of limited value. I think of uh, the better way of engaging is not on social media, but actually off social media, uh, in the way in which you seek out perhaps through, uh, you know, family activities, through common activities, through, uh, you know, things that we're not able to do right now because of the pandemic. But, uh, when we can get back to doing those things, get back to a more communal life. Uh, I think what I would love to see, wouldn't it be great? Can't be, wouldn't it be wonderful if when we re-engage, when we relearn the habits of, of social interaction with people, if we did so in more constructive ways that maybe started off not first by telling your uncle what an idiot he is because of his, his, his political views right off the block box, uh, starting block, but rather, started to say, how's your mama and them? How are you doing? Have you got through it okay? And then maybe building from that to a point, a platform of trust where we can start interacting with each other about politics in more constructive ways. I'm a philosopher, so I obviously talk about ideals. I'm an optimist. I don't apologize for either thing, but I think it's important to try to achieve these sort of aspire to these sorts of goals uh, when we're thinking about justice. And um, I couldn't agree more. It's, I think part of our responsibility as academics is to, to you know, to do that. Um, thank you for sharing your optimism today. What, one of the areas of your book that I found most intriguing is um, related to our final question, which is from and my colleague in UCD um, in the School of Music, Wolfgang Marx. And Wolfgang says, what about the relativist positions in, in the context of what you're talking about? The belief that there is no such thing as absolute truth, but it's just your truth and my truth. And uh, that the outcome then depends not on convincing anyone, but having more followers then and um, being better at social media and getting more people to sub subscribe to your truth. Um, you know, when, when uh, maybe talk about that relativist uh, position a little more. Right. Well, um, so relativism about truth uh, in the, you know, can come in a variety of different forms. Some of it, from my standpoint, more politically destructive than others. Relativism, as, uh, uh, as many of you know here, because we have some experts on it, um, comes in, you know, a, a big spectrum, like any philosophical position. And many of the people, of course, who say things like there's no truth or there's only my truth or your truth might not even actually be trying to articulate a particularly, uh, a, a really philosophical view. Sometimes when people say things like, well, uh, I've got my truth, you've got your truth. What they really mean is they're not talking philosophy. What they're do really doing is saying, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Leave me alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Fair yeah. enough. Right. Fair yeah. enough. Right. <laughs> I mean, people were, use these phrases in unphilosophical ways, and that's that's fine. Mm. Um, uh, but when we'd we agree to disagree, about, right? Yes, yes. exactly. We, we, <laughs> let's agree to disagree. That's what they mean, right? Um, and so it's you know sometimes you don't want to read into that too much. But as as the questioner indicates, um, sometimes you do. You sometimes you have to. Because there is uh, a, a level of what we might call not just relativism, but skepticism about, the, about truth um, uh, that can be politically damaging. Uh, I don't think you need to believe that there's such a thing as perfectly absolute truth or, or, or you know, the one and only true story of the world to think that uh, some stories of the world are false. There can be ties for first place when it comes to stories of, 
of, of the life, the universe and everything. But there are definitely ones that we want to rule out. Because again, if you can't make sense of that thought, you can't make sense of things like political progress. Mm. So I think to the extent to which we're sort of as, de as Democrats, as people are committed to democracy, to the extent to which we're committed to that second vision, the vision of polit that political progress is possible, we're committed to the idea that there is sense to be made of, 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 of a standard that maybe it's not the standard from which the universe exists, the God's eye point of view, but there are standards that, that are, uh, that um, go beyond just the standards of our particular interests, our motivations, um, and our party's interest and motivations. I think that's the sort of thing we have to uh, admit um, if we want to make sense of, of political progress at all. I hope that was helpful. Oh, so helpful. Michael, thank you so much for your, your wonderful um, talk today and uh, for answering so many of the the people's questions. Um, I completely agree with Angela Long at the start. It would be great to have you back and to give you twice as long to speak the next time. And we <laughs> perhaps we we see you again for uh, when you're when you're the book that you're working on at the moment is is published. And it's so interesting that 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 uh, question or hit on an area that you're you're interested in at the moment. So we we are so grateful for your your contribution today. Um, ladies and gentlemen that are watching, if you've missed um, any of today's talk, or indeed if this is the first of the Untruths lecture series that you're attending, you can visit the Paratia website where you can, um, you can rewatch uh, the, the previous talks and uh, the questions and answers that follow. You can also register or come to Heather Douglas's talk on May 18th. Professor Douglas will be talking about trustworthy science advice. Um, something that uh, I, as a physicist, um, I'm particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. So we, we look forward to that. And we'll also have Dan Spieber then two weeks later on June 1st. And that will conclude the first half of the Untruths lecture series. We'll be back in the autumn with some more uh, interesting topics. So um, it, it just leaves me to thank Professor Michael Lynch again for his wonderful talk today, to thank my fellow uh, panelists for helping with the organization and to thank you for tuning in and for engaging with such wonderful questions and uh, for listening to Professor Lynch's answers. Thank you all, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>